Ah yes, the temptation of the new and shiny. The smell of plastic fresh out of the box that is both exciting and repulsive at the same time. Exciting because it's the smell of a newly acquired favorite object, repulsive because you subconsciously wonder if that smell might be somehow carcinogenic. But let's not kid ourselves, this new stuff is fancy and I'm not used to fancy. I belong here with the old and forgotten. But maybe there can be a bridge between the old and the new sometimes. And that is also true for some power tools. Want to know how and why? Well then follow me along as I once again visit some scrapyards on the hunt for tools and other items that came here before their time. This is the Scrapyard Reparathon and let's see what we find here today then. I'm looking inside an almost empty container and over there I'm seeing something that might be interesting. It's a cordless reciprocating saw and I'm going to take that with me then. Over here we have a lot of metal roofing panels. Makes me wish I had a building to put them on. Unfortunately, that is not yet the case. And what do we have here? It's an old battery powered drill and it has the Hilti name on it. Not bad. Over here we even find the original charger. Another keeper then. And here we have parts of a ladder that was probably going to be installed permanently onto some structure. It was welded from massive steel parts and is freshly galvanized, but then someone cut it into pieces with a cutting torch. What a shame and what a waste of resources. Over here in this bathtub another cordless drill and it seems to be reasonably well made, keeping that as well. This red hand truck here is from an oxyacetylene torch, I'm sure, uh, but I already have one of those. What do we have here then? Even more, in this case, even older battery powered drills. A company must have thrown everything out that nobody there has used in years. I wasn't sure at first if I really wanted to buy these as well, but then a minute later I found this Black & Decker drill and I accepted this as a sign of sorts. Well, I guess, welcome to the Scrapyard Reparathon Cordless Tools Focus episode then. I'd say let's get back to the shop then and let's see if we can bring some of these oldies back to life. And to be completely honest, well, these aren't the only cordless tools I have lying around. I find them all the time at scrapyards or in dumpsters and it's time to come up with some ideas for this problem. One big issue is that these machines were built for different voltage levels. Then there's a problem that nickel cadmium batteries were outlawed a number of years ago. And also, of course, a lot of the manufacturers play their little games with their own shapes of the battery packs, with proprietary connectors and so on and so forth. So you end up with 15 different battery packs, some of which don't exist anymore. I guess it's time to convert all these tools to a standard that we can still work with today and to come up with some ideas for their reuse. And that is what I'm going to present in this video why bringing these tools back to life. Before we start the repairs and modifications, one word about adapters. You can buy adapters to connect cordless tools of one manufacturer to the batteries of another. Some people also build their own adapters with 3D printers. But I'm going to do it a little differently. One of my ideas has to do with these connectors for the Makita 18 volt system that you can buy for just a few bucks online. It will allow us to bring a number of these tools back very easily without the need for 15 different adapters and that is what I'm going to show you among other things in this video. So let's get going then. The first tool we're going to have a look at is this reciprocating saw we found down at the bottom of that container. TIP or TIP is or was a trade name used for tools of various manufacturers that were sold in hardware stores here in Germany. It's basically a no-name tool. The old battery holder is damaged and the original 18 volt nickel cadmium battery is missing. If we can get the saw running again we will convert it to an 18 volt lithium ion battery system instead. I personally don't even use cordless tools very often since I mostly work here in the shop at this very workbench. I also try to use old tools that I have salvaged from scrapyards and most of those just have power cords. However, we have a few Makita 18 volt tools here at the shop. They mostly belong to a buddy who works here at this place as well. 
And we already have a charger and a number of Makita battery packs and that's why I will use their 18 volt system. It's not because I prefer them over other brands like Bosch or Ryobi or whatever else might be popular. Upon opening the enclosure we can see how this crank mechanism causes the saw blade to move back and forth. And I'm now connecting a 12 volt lead acid battery to the old battery connector inside the enclosure. When you do this you have to be sure about the correct polarity because of the speed controller. And we can see that it works just fine. This tool was not thrown away due to malfunction, but probably because the old NICAD battery died and there just wasn't a proper replacement at hand. I'm applying some new grease and start the conversion to the Makita system. To install the new connector, that part is first taken apart. Then a few holes are drilled through its outer shell and through the bottom of the saw. Tools with that type of old-fashioned battery slot are ideal for this conversion because they are flat and you can just bolt the connector to that bottom plate. I use M3 nuts and bolts for this job. The bolts are secured with Loctite, otherwise they would probably get shaken loose too easily. I use four bolts in total. With that being done, I remove the old battery connector and strip off some of the insulation on these wires. I solder them together and insulate the connection with heat shrink. We can put the enclosure back together now for a first test. And the saw works as expected. However, there might be one problem. The old type of Makita battery pack we have at the shop here doesn't have an indicator that can tell you about the battery's charging status. And since I'm not sure if they have any kind of undervoltage protection circuit, I'm going to add an indicator to the saw itself. The thing here is that you suck all the energy out of the battery, you might damage it and our tools here do not have any protection circuit. I bought a number of these little voltmeters here. You can get those for under 5 euros online and they will allow you to get a heads up if the battery voltage is reaching its lower limit. In order to insert the meter, I first drill a couple of holes into the side of the saw. I also use a Dremel tool to cut through the plastic. A knife or file can be used to shape the hole into its final form. The wires leading to the meter are also just connected in parallel to the battery, red to red and black to black. I have also replaced the voltmeter's original leads with more flexible silicone ones, so they won't break so easily. The meter is then glued in place with elastic MS polymer adhesive. The insulating tape simply keeps all the parts in place until the glue has dried here. By the way, throughout this video, the glue that I'm using is all MS polymer, which stands for modified silane. It's strong yet elastic and adheres to all kinds of surfaces, but can be removed with a knife if you want to separate parts again. And after a day or two, the glue has dried and the saw is now ready for action. The next patient is this Hilti brand cordless drill we found together with its original charger. The battery pack is a 12 volt nickel cadmium system and of course it's completely discharged and no longer useful. It says made in Japan and who knows in the end Makita made this for Hilti. Inside the battery slot we find a date code from 1994 and at the time of this recording that was 27 years ago. Opening the enclosure again requires a little more than unscrewing some Torx screws. 
I'm cleaning the insides a little bit with some baby wipes and again connect a 12 volt battery to the old connector. And I'm pretty sure it's another tool that had to go because of the dead battery and not because of a malfunction. The speed controller allows you to set the voltage across the motor between roughly 5 and 12 volts. This little oscilloscope was sent to me by a viewer and thanks again for that. What you can see right away is that this works as expected with pulse width modulation. So this is a 12 volt system. There are modern 12 volt lithium ion battery systems out there and also from Akita for example but we want to have one system for everything here so I'm going to convert this to 18 volts and in order to make that possible I will add this buck converter to the drill. It has clamps for the supply voltage and for the load as well as a small trim port to adjust the output voltage. It's a standard design that you will find on well-known platforms by simply looking for the term buck converter or step-down converter. It costs only a few bucks. Since the handle of this old drill is hollow, we will have enough space to integrate the converter into the machine. And I turn that little trim part to adjust the converter so that we will have roughly 12 volts across the motor at full speed. After that the converter is fastened inside the enclosure with glue and another rectangular hole needs to be cut into the enclosure and this time I'm doing it without a dremel, just drill holes in a roughly rectangular form, cut away the remaining plastic with a small side cutter and use a knife to get a more defined shape. Meter and battery holder are glued in place and the whole thing is again left to dry for two days. And the old drill still does what it was made for. It might not be the fastest model out there, but it can screw, unscrew and drill holes. Let's get on then with the next tool, the Kress brand cordless drill made in Switzerland and greetings go out to the neighbors in the south. And by the way, this is the 22nd episode of the Scrapyard Reparathon and you can find links to all the previous episodes down in the video description. Give them a chance. The Crest drill was built for 15.6 volt NICAT and I believe that I can power this with 18 volts lithium ion without damaging the motor. The old battery is again dead, but this time we have also another fault. The chuck is very rusty and completely stuck. In order to test the drill we have to find out about the polarity of the battery connectors. And this time I have to open the battery pack to see what the four pins of the pack are actually good for. Inside we find the old nickel cadmium cells. We also find a thermistor inside, probably an NTC, which stands for negative temperature coefficient thermistor and its purpose is to let a power tool know about an overheating of the battery pack. But we can also learn about the polarity of the battery pack. The thermistor is integrated into the enclosure. This drill however doesn't even connect to it. It does not have any kind of circuitry except for the speed controller but that might be different with other Kress brand tools. And now that we know the polarity we can again do our little test with the 12 volt battery. Okay. 
And another drill that is basically working. Well, except for the chuck that is. It's indeed so stuck that no matter what I try, I can't get it to open up. I'm therefore using the brute force method, which in this case means cutting the chuck in half with an angle grinder. We can now see the little left hand screw that we would have to remove to get the chuck off. But it as well appears to be stuck. So we cut it off as well. I can now remove the chuck. On cordless drills that are made to rotate in both directions, you know, for screwing and unscrewing, the chuck usually has a right hand thread, righty tighty, lefty loosey, and a left hand screw inside, righty loosey, lefty tighty. Well, be that as it may, we'll have to install a new one. But first, I'm again opening the enclosure to connect the Makita battery holder. And you know the routine. Clean from inside, add voltmeter, solder and heat shrink and put it back together. And another old drill that was unfortunately beyond reasonable repair had acted as a donor machine for a replacement chuck here. And here is the left hand screw that you have to tighten by rotating it in counterclockwise direction. And it looks like we are ready for the next test then. I proceeded to use this technique that I have shown you for more of my used drills. This 18 volts Einhell drill here was also built for 18 volts, but for Einhell's own battery connector. I simply don't have any batteries for it though. So I cut that connector off with an angle grinder and glued the Makita connected to it instead. And there you go. But there are other, maybe cheaper ways to bring some old cordless tools back to usefulness. And I'm sure many of you have done similar things before. See this Einhell drill, before we converted it to the Makita standard, it was simply connected to the lead acid battery you have seen a number of times in this video. If you have cordless tools, especially 12 volt tools, of which there are many, you can use a 12 volt power supply as well. A server PSU, an ATX PSU, or even an old adapter like this as long as it can deliver enough current, of course. I've done this many times before and I've tried to come up with a slightly more elegant version based on that basic idea. So these three drills were made for 12 volts, but I will use them with a cord that can connect to various 12 volt sources around the shop. Since we won't need the battery holder anymore, I use a hacksaw to cut off the foot of that drill. I clean the cut with a file and then I draw the outline of the handle onto a piece of aluminium. Then a hole is drilled into it where a jack will be placed. But first you can then use an angle grinder or a hacksaw or even a big side cutter to get it into the rough shape and then use a file after that. The jack is then soldered to the wires leading into the drill and the aluminium plate is glued to the drill and is then left to dry. I actually did this very same thing to the 12 volt DeWalt and Black and Decker drills as well. And in the next step I connect a wire to the server power supply here. It's a bit dangerous to have the contacts lying open like this. It's only 12 volts but the PSU can deliver enormous currents. You should cover them up when doing this. But well, it's enough for a test.
But if you still want to be mobile with these tools that were made to be portable, well, here is another idea. But what if we connected these tools to batteries instead of a stationary power supply? Well, the question would be then where or how we would carry those batteries. Here, for example, we have like a big lithium polymer battery as it's used in e-bikes. Here are a rather heavy 12 amp hours LED battery. And I think the way to go would be ha to have bags. This, for example, has a shoulder strap, but can also be strapped around your waist. Yeah, I'm not saying it's the most practical idea in the world. Of course, uh, the bag looks rather bulky here. It's also because I stuffed like a towel in there to have some padding around the battery because it's like rather sharp edged and hard. But um, well, it can be done. I'm just trying to think out of the box here. Uh, but there is something else about these bags that I've been wanting to talk about. For a bigger battery, you could have one of these well, mid-sized backpacks here, and <laughs> well, just on a on a side note here, uh, I've bought like a large number of these old bags here, and these were made for the East German Army some 30 years ago, and back in the day, they were some of them were made uh, in former Soviet Union states, others were made in East Germany, and we called that. Well, these armed for forces were called NVA. That's not like the Northern Vietnamese troops, but that would be like Nationale Volksarmee, the National People's Army, and that was the army of the DDR or GDR, German Democratic Republic. And apparently a large uh, stock of all kinds of materials and equipment existed for that army when it ceased to exist. And, well, I think a bunch of... Business people at the time bought these stocks and, well, they still exist and I, I got my share of them. And here we have, uh, well, it's a draft for a kind of patch for patches that I designed because I thought that I might maybe sell some of these as merchandise sooner or later. It's still in the development phase, so the patches are still made from cardboard. So what do you think? Would you like to have maybe one of these bags um, or maybe just a patch? Let me know in the comments or maybe send me an email if you're really interested. So guys, we focus a lot on one type of tool today. We'll probably be different in other scrapyards in the future. But if you like the Scrapyard Reparathon and if you like this episode, then please give it a like and let me know down in the comments. That way I know that I should make more of them. And if you want to support this channel in other ways, then you can, for example, donate via PayPal. A link for that is down in the video description. Or you can become a supporter on patreon.com slash TPAI. See you soon, guys.